Check one. If you can hear me, let me know. If you can hear me, let me know. Good evening, folks. Hello, hello. Hey, Jason. As always, if you're watching the VOD of this video, feel free to skip the intro. There's a timer on the screen and just scurry on ahead on the red bar <laughs> to when I actually start reviewing stuff. But for now, I'm settling in after a day at work and getting ready to cover Flying Circus, which I've heard good things about. Well, hello, familiar faces. Hello, Radis. Welcome back. Hello, Dyphus. Good evening to you, too. Ooh, there's names. Rowan McClantock. I'm not sure. Have you been at a previous stream? I'm, looking, <laughs> I'm not sure if I remember him. I apologize. Splotchy Inc. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If any of you guys, if any of you guys have time in the next three and a half minutes, feel free to mention any games that might cover the concept of flight really well. That's what I'm looking forward to. Um, understanding how this game handles flight, which is famously a tricky mechanic to get right. Shepard1707 Flying Circus. Oh, a Flying Circus fan. I'm letting you guys know right now, I have no idea how this game plays out. I took a brief glance at it, just a, a, a quick peruse. Uh, first things first, it's a very long read, so I don't expect to get through the whole thing. And two, I noticed that it mentions PBTA, so hopefully I'll understand a thing or two about the game. I'm an Air Force vet, and I never heard of this, so I'm very interested in this one. Interesting, Jason. That's cool. I can I could not tell you if this game handles it well, but I, <laughs> but my friend sent me like a resource or two, and I, there were so many words I did not understand. Um, so I guess my goal for this stream is to um, hit the mechanical concepts and at least try to comprehend them or at least see how they handle them. Um, get a little bit of the setting, understand where this is coming from, uh, and just a vibe, because I don't expect to know the game by the end of this stream. I will just peruse, and hopefully if this game interests you, um, you can most certainly read into it. Um, most of the... Shepard says most of the lore stuff is in the back of the book, good to know. I'm going to check out the table of contents and see where we're coming from. Uh, Splotchy Inc. says it kind of doesn't. It's a PBTA game. It handles the light very abstractly. That's okay. I've played, um, as someone who's played a good amount of masks, uh, I know that sometimes it's just better to um, speak flight into the story. I'm not looking to um, get into I fly 100 feet vertically and 60 feet horizontally. That's not really what, what I'm playing for. So the concept of the best version of flight is in premise uh, subjective. I'm not certain what other games even try to the extent that Flying Circus does. Valid. Valid. Of course, I'm familiar for people familiar with my channel. Um, I only really know D&D. And their flight handling is, uh, you know, enough, right? <laughs> the word we're looking for is enough. Where they don't really care if you're going diagonally or up or down. A distance is a distance. And diagonals are the same thing as straight lines. Uh... Again, best is subjective. So I'm curious of if you've seen any that kind of ha try to do their best to tackle flight, so to speak. Flying games really need the air to the mind. I agree. I agree that it's sometimes just best to say, if you say you want to fly, you fly. And that's kind of how it is. The cover shows biplanes. I expect wing walking. <laughs> In. Let me get my glass of water. All right, let's begin. Today we're talking about Flying Circus. I believe Flying Circus is game number 18 in our 99 more series. We're almost a fifth of the way there. Oh, let me get rid of my gum. <laughs> Um, I can't claim to be an expert on this game at all. I uh, This is a recommendation to uh, to me by my friend. Um, basically, a great, about half of the games I've covered 
in this series are in fact recommendations from people I trust. So I don't really know what this game is going to be like, but I'm excited to kind of look into it because it touches on a thematic that I am wholly unfamiliar with, which is um, what I'm assuming to be a more mechanical approach. Um, I'm uh, specifically versed, no, I wouldn't say well-versed, but versed in medieval fantasy, in um, high fantasy settings, things that are mythical, magical. So concepts are stories more rooted to the ground and more um, closer to our era are things that are beyond my comfort zone and things that I'm only looking towards as a student. And Flying Circus is one of those games that I've heard about for many years, but never actually look into. Um, Flying Circus has been on my periphery by many people um, who I interact with. So I mean, it's good to finally <laughs> get a chance to look into this um, and enjoy it. I know there are people in this chat who understand the game much better than I do, and that's welcomed. Uh, if there's anything I miss, mess up or mistake, feel free to uh, inform me. But I'm going to read the description here for people who have no idea what they're walking into, and uh, it'll be my first exposure to what Flying Circus is. Flying Circus is an in-depth, highly detailed, Power by the Apocalypse-derived role-playing game of aviation fantasy. That's a combination of words I've never heard before, and that's really cool. Can I highlight on this thing? I sure can. I guess not. Yes. Yeah, cool. Set in a world of machines and magic inspired by the works of Hayao Miyazaki. In the aftermath of a massive industrial war, the world is slowly pulling itself back together, but danger still works in the skies of Himmelgard. The only things spend, uh, standing between the world and chaos are the brave pilots of the Flying Circuses, independent mercenary companies known for their bright and unique liveries liveries i don't know this word of their salvaged aircraft no mission is too bold no monster too big no foe too dangerous if you can afford it flying circus uses a unique system for air combat issuing top-down maps and creating altitude and airspeed as currency Ooh, what does this mean i have no idea what that could possibly mean that's so interesting to be spent in daring and realistic dogfights climb to gain the advantage dive to regain speed Pull your plane into dizzying turns to get on their tail, but you also face realistic limitations as your engine burns out, your wings crack and break, and you lose consciousness in a high G turn. In addition to the powerful air combat engine, Flying Circus has robust systems for battles and daring escapes on foot, for pilots to blow off steam in between missions, and for the financial and social aspects of running the company. Pilots always live on the edge, between excess and stress, between riches and ruin, between... It's pronounced liveries. Thank you, Splotchy Ink. Liveries. Between riches and ruin, between victory in disguise and impact with the ground. Flying Circus features 10 unique playbooks with both strong hooks to get started immediately and considerable framework for customization and progression over the course of a long campaign. The playbooks also come packed with 48 unique aircraft. 48 unique aircraft? both historical and fantastical to populate your games, as well as a variety of threats, mission prompts, advanced rules, and GM advice. A content warning, mature themes regarding violence, sexuality, and drug use. There is a degree of illustrated nudity. Okay, <laughs> I'll try to dodge that as I stream. Uh, and there are pictures of biplanes here. Awesome. That's really cool. That's really cool. Okay, so... Uh, for the record, this is by, if I haven't said it yet, this is by Open Sketchbook. Open Sketchbook has made a number of supplemental pieces for Flying Circus, which I'm seeing here, which includes Starter Planes, which includes Stories, um, which is really, really cool. They have a couple um, of other works here, The Flesh is Weak, Blackout, and Double or Nothing. If you want to support them, you can find them here. Their name is on stream, as well as right here, Erica Chapel. Uh, it is uh, at open underscore sketchbook. So if you want to check out their stuff, by all means. Um, <laughs> there are going to be... Um, there are going to be things in... I, I can already sense from this stream that there's going to be a number of people in chat who know uh, multitudes more than I do about, about planes, about this game in particular... Um, feel free to correct me if I get things wrong. 
Um, just know that I am not an expert in flying planes, but I absolutely enjoy when there are games so incredibly detailed into a niche to know so much about airplanes and aviation to build an entire game on it and build an entire combat system on the mechanics of flying that's awesome to me it's it's this is something that i personally could never ever dream up or concoct and seeing someone else do it so fully is very very exciting so i'm gonna tab over to the pdf fingers crossed this goes well oh wonderful And we will get to reading. Um, first, we will peruse um, peruse the table of contents, see what we're interested in, because this PDF is th 300 pages. <laughs> it's 300 pages of content. So uh, I, I have been assured from the very beginning that I will not be able to get through all of this. Um, but let it be known, this has a lot of stuff inside it. Uh, these are the people who've worked on it. Writing Design and Art by Erica Chapel. Editors and proofreaders, Kit, Kit Holler, Alexandra Altringham, uh, and there's a number of people credited for assistance. Uh, there's a whole lot of German language references as far as I've um, skimmed. So there will be things that I fully do not understand, but I, I, I believe this book can be found in the German language, which is very exciting. Awesome. Cool. Uh, let's read the intro of Pilot's Creed, and then we'll get to the table of contents. I, al I will always secure my advantages before I attack, and I will descend from the sun. When I attack, I will see it through to the end. I will fire my, mach my machine gun up close, and only when I am sure to land hits. I will never lose sight of my enemy. I will always approach my enemy from behind. When the enemy dives upon me, I will not flee. I will fly up to meet him. When the... Like when the fight breaks into duels, I will not chase a plane my comrade has in their sights. When I'm high above hostile lands, I will always remember the way home. Cool. Okay, so to look into the table of contents. We're going to zoom in and pan over. Um, let's try to figure out things that we are interested in looking into. So obviously... Um, the, the introduction, I feel like, is just generally important. We're going to highlight that. Um, interested in how they handle moves in this game. So I will handle that. Um, some of these words uh, I'm familiar with <laughs> uh, in terms of forward, ongoing, and hold. I'm curious about stress and experience. Um, curious about trust. That's interesting. Character creation. Um, hmm. Yeah, this seems important. Let's do, let's focus on these paint schemes. I'm guessing this is your people. So we'll look into this and then we'll brief glimpse at the world, the routine. Interesting. I don't want to highlight everything. I want to be able to bounce around if need be. Universal move should be pretty interesting. I specifically want to know what this is. What? Oh my gosh, what are these? Weapon system cards? There's a lot of stuff in this, and we're only a sixth of the way through the book. I want to glance at these. Again, I don't intend to understand these. I just want to see where they're going. Okay, and we have to look at air combat. This is this is mandatory. I'll color this like something else. No, I jumped to it. Is there a way to... No, there isn't. Okay. Okay. Um, these are maneuvers. So I'll only take a look at a couple of these. Um, I just want to see the general energy of maneuvers. I'll take a look at the first couple air combat moves. Stress relief? Sure. Um, I don't know if money is too important for this stream. 
and we'll look at advancement. We'll look at some of we'll look at two of the characters. Equipment we'll get to. Aircraft weapons, sure. I feel like this would be significant to people. And advanced rules. Maybe we'll avoid event advanced rules for this stream. <laughs> uh, I do want a game master. Um, I do want to look at the, how a game master should approach this game. Um, and we'll look at we'll look at some uh, some of the bad guys. Just brief glance. Interesting. Okay, and we'll look at just a briefest of settings. I think that's good for this stream. I don't know if we'll get to everything. You should really highlight eyeball. Very important. Eyeball. Page 76. Sure. They're right here. Okay. Agreed eyeballs. There's a lot of people in this stream who know this game. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. That's good. All right, let's start from the top. Let's just get to the introduction. Okay. For people who don't know, but I feel like this whole chat already knows. Flying Circus is a role-playing game about the fantasy and reality of being a flying ace in the days of early air combat. Over the course of the game, players will take their ramshackle aircraft into battle, find triumph and defeat get blackout drunk and have ill-advised sex with each other and find a way to, for some, to somehow pay for it all. There will be heroes and scoundrels, knights errant and killers for hire, and they just might find out who they are and where they belong if they don't crash and burn first. Heavily modified version of Powered by the Apocalypse adds many additional systems and mechanical details. Central to the experience is daring air warfare in a freeform environment without maps or minis. This is pretty significant. And constrained by air speed and altitude. I guess these are core concepts of the combat. Models of behaviors and characteristics of early aircraft in detail, both fictional and historical model models, and is paired with a complex and highly detailed aircraft construction system. It can be a dense game to learn, and there are a lot of moving parts. It can seem very intimidating at first, but when you master the system, you'll be able to fly. What is the setting? Watching Inc. says, Blast your choice of background music. I just spent several minutes seeing if I accidentally left my switch on. Yes. Uh, Breath of the Wild music is on permanent rotation on my streams. It is just the perfect background music. Uh, the setting. Set in fantasy world on the content continent of Himmelgard. Sprawling landmass of soaring mountains and tangled fords. Draws an early 20th century rural Germany. Interesting. European fairy tales and the cozy apocalypse aesthetic of early Ghibli to create a world of industry and fantasy where the aeroplane is a dominant form of travel. Ooh, cool. Humans have flown since before the wheel, so there are no roads. No roads, just airways and trade winds. I dig that. The wilderness is dark and filled with magic. So it's like a magical world, but people use airplanes more than cars. That's pretty exciting. Everything is rustic and worn and lived in, and most folks are decent more or less. Aeroplanes are beautifully rendered dreams, the detritus of a long ago war litters the landscape and in the shadows lurk things that are difficult to understand. So it's like, it is post-apocalyptic, but it's post-apocalyptic cozy core, which is cool. Not long ago, Himmelgard was ruled by a number of imperial states who carved out cities of stone and steel from the wilderness. Smoke pillaging factory complexes turned forth a dizzying, a dizzying array of airplanes and war machines. A never widening gulf between rich and poor brought intense social pressure and armed conflict was used as a recent release valve. These petty conflicts soon sparked something greater and more terrible. In the conflict, hundreds of thousands of aircraft were produced and destroyed. Wow. This is, this is a significant line. Eventually, the great empires wiped each other out with poison gas, leaving only isolated rural communities to pick up the pieces. These communities were beset all, on all sides by monsters, bandits, deserters, and pirates, so they turned to their heroes to save them. Brave pirates took up the surplus machinery of war, painted in bright and inspiring colors, and flew in their defense. It's been about two decades. Only two decades? Only two decades until the entire world was, like, wrecked with war and gas? Wild. The world is recovering and people are reconnecting with one another, one another but is no less dangerous, so the flying circuses still take to the air. 
Some are still valiant heroes, others are opportunists looking to make quick cash, but all brave terror and death with every flight. Interesting. So it is a fantasy setting. We should establish it is a fantasy setting. There is magic and monsters involved in this. Um, and this is post-apocalypse. So this is post-destruction. And this is kind of a world left in ruin in the wake of war. Where people are still kind of picking up the pieces after a whole lot of people were wiped out. Interesting. Okay. I can stick with that concept. Uh, game can... The game is intended for multi-session campaign play. That makes sense. Um, session zero is the first session, mostly in setup and creating characters. Makes sense. There's a game master in this game. Good to know. Each of these PCs is a natural born pilot picked from one to 10 backgrounds. These backgrounds represent the life before taking before taking to the skies, give a cross-section of the kind of places in the world, so you know that behind every pilot is a community with a defined character. Together the characters form a flying circus. Oh, so that's the word that's what it is. It's like the flying circus is the group or the crew. A mercenary company that hires itself out to settlements in need of protection, assistance, or muscle. They're an adventuring party in the traditional sense, but also a business which is often perilously close to folding under the expenses associated with keeping their planes running. This reminds me of Drifting Dragons, if anyone's seen that Netflix anime, where it's a whole lot of people who are on one aircraft, and that aircraft kind of tours the world picking up jobs. And in that specific anime, they, they you know, hunt dragons and sell the meat. This kind of has the, the same vibe, where it's half fantasy, half tech. Resources, playbook, and instrument panel. What is this? I don't know what this word means yet. Component cards or scrap paper. You should print out the GM sources, a master sheet or two, and the play references, plus a single company roster for the group. I mean, a calculator might just help. Hmm. Okay. Flying Circuits uses some smaller printouts on index cards, such as weapon and tracking cards. For dice, Flying Circus uses D10s and D20s. Oh, so there's only two. The best practice is to have two D10s for every player and a large pile of D20s. A third D10 of a different color is also helpful. Also helpful. You should also have a nice collection of tokens. This, the best candidates are the transparent multicolored counting chips, often used to teach kindergarten students the basics of mathematics. They are cheap, colorful, and you can see through them when you place them on sheets as trackers. Oh, so they're used for tracking on sheets. Got it. And you can use them to represent coins. Okay. Flying Circus Air Aircraft Catalog Core is a free online document containing 50 aircraft for you to use, including all the base default starting designs for each compound. Huh. I guess I wait if I Google this, will I find it? Let's find out. Oh, okay, so it's free. Wait, just give me a sec. Maybe I can grab it and we can take a look at it. Yeah, just give me a second, guys. I'm gonna just... Quickly get it from drive through RPG. Load it up. Oh, faster than I expected. Splotchy Inc. says, The instrument panel is basically a secondary character sheet for bits and bobs of your airplane, like when you're playing a Euro game and you have your own little board that tracks your resources and abilities and all that. Oh. Okay. Okay, so this, I'm, I think it's on screen now, is the Flying Circus Aircraft Catalog Core. It is 67 pages. This is, this game is intensely thorough. Ooh, okay. So a couple of you airplane heads in the chat. <laughs> I'm so sorry. A couple of you uh, airplane enthusiasts. If I wonder if any of these words are familiar to you. Living Grove. A lot of these are just straight up German 
airplanes. All of this is going over my head. Cheeto fighter, cruiser scorpion, Jogermander class air destroyer, K class air corvette, skyborne windjammer. This seems like something more my speed. <laughs> um, wow. 50 aircraft or flying circus. This is so intense. This is what I mean by like an expert making a game. <laughs> How could you know so much about airplanes to ever write something like this? I don't, I don't care if half of this book is fantasy, like to have this degree of understanding that you could tap into all of this. Yeah, I'm sure some of this just pulls from fantasy and is kind of not necessarily um, history accurate, but just to have this degree of understanding of the different parts of an airplane to the point that like, what was it? Where did it say it? Um, so like some airplanes are some parts are rarer than others. Here. It's not all engines are easy to acquire. Sure, you might want to go off and stuff every plane with 300 horsepower Sam Carrier LV8 engine the moment you get a chance. Who doesn't? How real quickly run into the reality that every other pilot is also trying to do that? In the case of that particular engine, there's a whole actual government act actively trying to stop you from doing it. I absolutely love the idea of having to harvest parts of an airplane from a post apocalyptic world or from a market that is entirely ruined by war. Um, to make your aircraft better. I love that. I, and if, and if I was really into airplanes, I would really enjoy the idea of scavenging all of the best parts to make this killer machine that I could bring on my travels. Like I do that all the time with fantasy characters, like cobbling together swords and shields and armor and all the best parts so I can fight demons better. This is, this is some niche, um, this is some niche hobby work that I fully under, f can fully appreciate as an enthusiast of other things. Legendary, common, rare, and legendary engines. So the eras are as follows: Pioneer, World War One. Actually, we could just zoom in here. Um, Jason, I'll, I'll highlight these for you. Do any of these stick out to you as things that you would be interested in reading about? So this is Pioneer, World War One, Roaring Twenties, um, Coming Storm, World War Two, Last Hurrah. It seems like it spans from uh, pre-World War One to 1944. Any of those stick out to you as things that you would enjoy reading about? Um, by all means, this is free. This is, um, what was it called again? Flying, Flying Circus Aircraft Catalog Corps. And you could read into that. Oh no, he's going to get lost in the airplane. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. Oh my gosh. Uh, survivor planes, worker planes, switch planes, skyborne planes, believer planes, fisher planes. Which planes? Wait a sec, hello? Hi, which planes? Okay, whatever. Early aircraft anatomy. Oh my gosh, this is so much. Could you imagine making a 67 page supplement to your 300 page game? Oh, there's just pictures for every single one? <gasps> wow. Wow. Listen, I'm looking, <laughs> people watching me in chat who've watched me play nothing but horror games, academia games, and um, think games about potatoes for the last 15 weeks i don't understand a single word about this screen but i can i can certainly appreciate it <gasps> that's so funny okay wow i'm just gonna scroll through these pictures you guys can get look at them for a half second this one's a boat this one's just a boat can't convince me of something else wow this is so nice the artist for all of these planes oh my gosh if i was a plane enthusiast i would be absolutely loving this what is going on here? A Jeet Interceptor. 
It's got like a little thing, like a pincer. <laughs> it's nine o'clock. I should really get going to the actual book. <gasps> oh my gosh. Wow. Wait, I'm going to go to the back. Maybe the back has something really cool. Uh, This one's big. Wow. That's a crazy looking vehicle. Dude, I love blimps. I think blimps are so dumb looking, but they're so cool. <laughs> okay, you can't play as a blimp. Boo. <laughs> I'm gonna fly around as a blimp. The easiest thing to snipe in the sky. Okay, I there's only so many planes I can look at before. Whoa! That's a cool one. There's only so many planes I can look at before. Um just totally dissociating. Das Gegenbisfiel. I can't pronounce this word. Look at the living grove. Okay, I'm gonna get that's my that's the recommendation for this living grove. Ooh, it's woody. I like these vines here. That's kind of nice. I dig that. Oh, this is good energy. <laughs> Weakness is flammable. Yeah, that that would be flammable, wouldn't it? You don't want to be the person in a blimp in a dog fight. I mean, you say that, the, Watch Ink says, I mean, you say that the big advantage of blimps was that they flew so high normal airplanes couldn't get to them. On top of the fact that blimps actually increase altitude higher than a lot of old airplanes. I'll, I I couldn't tell you if you're wrong or right. I couldn't, I couldn't validate that information at all. <laughs> this one looks like it has a mustache. Um... <laughs> Uh, okay, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. This is beyond me. Let's start reading about the game again. <laughs> They're called dirigibles. Wait, I kind of know about this. They're dirigibles. Oh my gosh. There, there's, oh, what do I know about dirigibles? I had some super niche information about dirigibles that I no longer know. I made a podcast episode about flying and I had to learn about blimps and dirigibles to understand it. But to say I no longer know about it. <laughs> There is a car honking outside my window. This is a quality stream, guys. This is a quality stream. <laughs> anyway, um, content and safety. This is a game for adults. Variety of adult themes. That makes sense. Um, obviously, know who you're playing with and make sure you don't um, touch on it. Something think people aren't un in, uh, uncomfortable with. Um, model on a sort of idyllic rural Germany in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, invoke imagery and mindset of both the First World War and Grimm's fairy tales. Plus Hayao Miyazaki. What a what an interesting combination of, of ideas. Um, however, this imagery has a context and mythology of a racially and culturally homogenized historical dramatic people and homeland formed the core of the propaganda sped by the Nazi party during their rise and reign and was used as parts of the machine to justify and perform systematic genocide. Thus, it is important that this imagery is not used carelessly. Firstly, there is refutation of this hateful mythology by rejecting the premise of a homogenous people. Yes, of course. Flying Circus builds a variety of cultures, both fantastical and familiar, into the process of character creation and centers the narrative of cultural exchange. Some play books focusing specifically on one of these cultures. Cultural groups are explicitly made Phenotypically diverse in order to head off any idea that you should be playing a white character to match the setting. Your character can look like anyone. There's no false pretense of a statistical historical averages from bow to here. If anybody is playing this game specifically because you want to channel a very unfortunate period of, of Germanic history, you're probably playing the wrong game. Um, players should enter this game with the knowledge that Himmelgard is neither historical Germany nor the fascist imagining of it. It is a messy fantasy world of, with many cultural groups. Fantastic. Fallen and death. I don't think we should read into this, but obviously people die. This is a game about dog fights. Uh, queerness sucks and in intimacy. Um, the cultural pilot is essentially a queer one, both directly and through metaphor. The central narrative of every character's life is leaving home due to the incompatibility of finding a new family of people who share your passion. Um, yes, please. If you're going to go into any of this stuff, fade to black, make sure your table is comfortable with it. Um, it is okay to be emotional. It is okay to be intimate with your fellow players just at their own comfort zones. Please. <laughs> uh, excess drinking and drug use. Yes, this can happen. This is an adult game. And youth, of course, it's a coming-of-age narrative. 
um, respect if you want to play a child it says here we know that these pilots were as young as 16 you don't need to do that and you and if you are going to play very young characters in a war type game obviously with the territory understand what that might entail session zero is so 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 important please handle it with your players i will try not to skip safety tools in any coverage of any game i and i do on this stream uh safety tools of course understand them um we have um oh safe words interesting um word your signals again i always recommend the x card and lines and veils it's a very simple way to handle these sort of things and make sure to discuss that at session zero central session zero the conversation uh a role-playing game is a conversation that creates a compelling story through actions and reactions the rules govern this conversation by providing prompts limiting and prescribing outcomes creating twists and pushing things in new directions it's like a dance it can be orderly orderly or chaotic carefully planned or spontaneous but the best are intense and intimate and scandalize any old folks who might be watching the conversation in flying circus has a certain familiar rhythm the gm establishes the circumstances and the stakes acting as the eyes and ears of the characters the players describe how their characters act in light of what they know and ask clarifying questions the gm adjusts and refines the circumstances in reaction and the cycle repeats classic ttrpg stuff Right. So we would want to say again that this game is inspired by Powered by the Apocalypse, which runs on a... Well, actually, what's interesting about this is that they made no mention of the 2d6 dice that are familiar to Powered by the Apocalypse, um, which usually dictates the range of 2 to 12 success partial success and failure so i'm curious in how they handle this if they're saying they're powered by pd uh they're a pbta game interesting so moves are a a uh, cornerstone of the powered by Apocalypse setting and moves are triggered by a trigger every move has a trigger in um a corresponds to action in the narrative great moves work best when you bring them in to match what was just said in the narrative rather than invoking them overtly to make something happen we call that to do it you do it in other words, don't say, I want to invade. Tell everyone how you evade, what you do to avoid crashing. It'll add more context to the move and to give you and the GM more to work with. Conversely, sometimes a player doesn't want to use a specific move, but it still it speaks to trigger into fiction. Right. So you don't necessarily say, I want to do this move. You say, I want to do this thing. And the GM is like, oh, that sounds a lot like this move. So... Shepard says it uses 2d10 instead of 2d6. Oh, makes sense to me. Oh, okay. So here, it's right here. So it's not 2d6, it's 2d10 from 1 to 10. Uh, 11 plus is a hit. 10 or less is a miss. 11 to 15 is partial hit. 16 plus is a full hit. Are the odds of that different? I wonder. Are the odds of that different than the 2d6? Probably not by much. Not by a significant statistical margin. But bigger numbers are cool. Okay, so the stats that I'm seeing so far are hard and calm. Interesting. Some moves ask you to roll a number of 20-sided dice, but still looking for 16 plus or 11 to 15. Apply your modifiers to each d20 individually, treating each like you treat 2d10. On rare occasions, you'll be asked to roll a, two, a d5. Because five-sided dice are awful, roll a d10 and divide the results in half, rounding up. I'm curious, what does a d5 look like? We're actually gonna take a we're actually gonna take a break from from reading this to find out what the heck uh, a d5 looks like. There's no incriminating information on my drive-through RPG page, right? No, cool. D5 dice. 
No, I want to see an image. Those are D... Oh. It's a D5. <laughs> are you guys... Yeah, you guys are seeing this. Five-sided dice. Huh? That's not... That's not a fair die. Okay. What is this? Oh, mm, that's a six-sided die. Yeah, there's a six on it. This? Oh, I, I can see the tube working. I know the jelly bean. I know the the three is a jelly bean. I, I can vibe with that. That is not a real die. <laughs> there's no way that's a real die. Five? Five? Is this? No, this isn't fair, is it? There's no way this is fair. It makes no sense. Maybe this one? Oh, that still looks... <laughs> kind of gross. I can't find... This seems like the most fair D5, right? The tube one? The tube one seems like the most fair D5. We're totally detracting from the game. This is... I want to find like... Yeah, this. This is like what I imagine to be like a proper, completely fair five-sided die. And I won't take anything else for an answer. Like this, this one seems dumb. There's no way this one's like a real thing. And I don't trust this for my life. There's no way I trust this one. <laughs> okay, well, the gross ones are property five. This is, you're telling me this is balanced? There's no way this, there's no way the triangle one is balanced because those are just different sided sides. Those are just different sized sides different size platforms this one the jelly bean one kind of works because they all correspond with the specific flat side but there's no way this triangle one is, is correct the gross ones as they have more lines of symmetry than cylindrical one uh... You know what? I, I'll go get myself a D5 and I'll tell you what I think about it. <laughs> I'm sure there's science behind it. Five-sided. Oh my gosh. There's a podcast about it. Check out Five-Sided Dice. Actually, this is not an official endorsement. Never mind. I'm not gonna <laughs> not gonna sponsor a podcast I've never seen before. Let's get back to airplanes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Um, for people not familiar, uh, I, there's probably a great, you know, Splotchy Inc., there's probably a great YouTube video about D5s. I wouldn't be surprised if someone's out there telling me the... <laughs> anyway, um, forward, on going and hold. These are common concepts in Powered by the Apocalypse games. Um, forward means that the next roll gets your bonus. Ongoing means that you have... Um, that you have a passive bonus until something happens, so it keeps... It continues until you meet a certain condition or something stops it and hold is a bonus that you can use when you want it to apply so you can hold on to it kind of keep it in hiding until something appropriate uh allows you to use it what's up josh <laughs> thank you chat for for always knowing more than i do uh advantage and disadvantage Stress. Oh, I did want to look into stress. Um, when pilots land and process what they've experienced, they will, these will be converted to stress. Stress has to be dealt with sooner rather than later because characters will quickly find themselves burning out if they don't. Acquiring a, acquiring a great deal of stress will prevent character advancement and eventually cause a character to snap and act out. Stress comes to a head just before characters go back up in the air. So in between, the game focuses on reducing stress through hedonistic excess and interpersonal relationships detailed on page 88. Every time a point of stress is cleared, the player gets an experience point. By expending XP, they can learn new moves, improve their stats, and otherwise add to their character. Generally, the fastest way to advance a character is to take a lot of stress and then work it off. But this is a dangerous tightrope to walk. Interesting. Okay, so you, you fly, you gain stress, you land, you trade out stress for experience points by reducing that stress. Okay. Advancement system. Makes sense. Injury and death. 
I just briefly skipped ahead. You can only die if you choose to. Cool. Um, players take injury when they get personally hurt. Oh, there's just a capitalize. This is a mechanic. When they get personally hurt or as a result of enemy fire, a bad crash, lost fight, or some other mechanism. You take an ongoing penalty to all attributes equal to the amount of injury you've sustained until you've healed. Once you reach three or more, you pass out, dropping out of the story for a short time. Oh, so this is like... This is basically like the health bar. Um, I'm familiar with like conditions from other PBTA games, so you don't really have like a health bar in terms of like how much damage you're taking, but injuries, I suppose here, once you reach three or more, that is what pulls you out of the fight or pulls you out of the situation. When you're revived or come to, you are not variably in a much worse position. You can keep receiving injury past that point and keep acting once you come to, though further injury will knock you out again. A pallet could potentially have five or more injury and need extensive medical treatment, but be alive and limping on. It might be narratively appropriate. You can pass out of <laughs> You pass out at 2,500 meters altitude with a wing missing. You're probably not going to make it out alive. However, it's always your choice. You can say, I don't think this is the end of my story, and you'll miraculously survive, but you might wish you hadn't. Ooh, good line. Injury is healed through medical attention, so injured characters need to see a doctor or some kind to recover. When characters start getting hurt, this is a sign to stop fighting and start running. Keeping track. A clock. We understand clocks from Blades in the Dark. Gauges track damage to locations on your aircraft. Whoa, okay. So certain sections of your plane can be injured. That's wild. That's interesting. Huh. And then obviously an altitude, airspeed, and fuel. We've mentioned before that these are tracked mechanics. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So there's like multiple gauge. There's like multiple. I guess the word is gauges. There's multiple gauges on your sheet and you use tokens to kind of track your progress on each of them that makes a lot of sense penny speeds are game pieces Ooh, trust okay relationships between char player characters and flying circus are handled with a mechanic called trust trust is a binary non-reciprocal state handled with a simple check mark do you trust this person cool that's simple when you trust somebody, you die for them. If they get in a fight, you're right there throwing punches. Even when they're wrong, you'll back them up. If they need money, you won't hesitate to lend to them. When you don't trust somebody, they're scum. You don't lend them money, you don't stand up for them, you don't help them out of trouble they got themselves into, you only work with them because you have to. When you defy death on a daily basis, you live in the moment because you could well die tomorrow. The environment of nebulous consequences drives pilots to be quick to anger and equally quick to forgive. Players, players can break trust with other players over anything they want, or nothing at all. Rebuilding that trust happens when a player decides to put aside their distaste for another, to stand by them or help them. With one exception, trust only applies between player characters. It's interesting that it... So, what I'm, what I'm curious, or at least intrigued about this mechanic, is the word binary, where you trust them or you don't trust them. You're either ride or die, or you, you're just not for them at all. There's no like middle ground, but I suppose middle ground doesn't really lend itself to the, the theme of the game where you guys are flying basically death machines. So there has to be either a very sincere, very honest and very tough level of trust between people, or you simply cannot, you can't be that wishy-washy in your decision. You have to either trust them or not. So. For, for the mechanic of trust to be binary is actually really interesting. For it to be like just a two sides of a coin is a choice. And it's a mechanical choice to, to both simplify the concept and exemplify the intensity of the occupation. Nice. And this is money. In it, the, the fall of the old world took its money with it. In its place, every town issues its own currency. Script is almost beneath your notice. To regulate trade between towns, the trading companies use a currency called, currency called a thaler, which is a big spoked gold coin the size of a beer coaster with a glass bead in the middle. A thaler is worth a lot of money. Like a few months pay for a poor laborer. Oh, wow. 
The game only cares about the company budget. It's up to players to work out how individual spending should work, how profits are shared, and when they can dip into the budget for personal expenses. It's a cool design. Okay, prep phase. And we'll, we'll skim this. Because I imagine this is very similar to other PPDA games. So describe the genre, story ideas, tone of the game. And of course, um, content and safety. Then you make your characters. Answer the trust question. So do you trust each other's characters? And then the company. The company is, I'm assuming, the name of the group that you're, hand, you're traveling with. Uh, and then the region map. So, oh, interesting. I'm curious about this region map. And then individually fill in your instrument panel. Okay, so I'm curious about region map. I'm curious about instrument panel. But it seems like this first part is the session zero. Or at least like understanding what kind of game you guys are all playing. Then you make your characters, link the characters, and link the characters as a whole in the terms of a company. So let's look towards region map. Oh, interesting. These are backgrounds that you could dive into. Again, which sticks out to me as something distinct, distinctly different from the rest of them in terms of how they interact with magic. They have, then they have nobility, feral child, Skyborn is a cool concept. Live their life in the air. A fisher has ties. To, okay, so it's just not a someone who. It's not a fisherman. It's like a proper concept of like a. It just. I get warlock vibes from this, but cool. Okay. So you're expected to know your name and your hometown, your history, your, your the people you grew up with. Great. Assets and baggage. So this is like your items, the things you start out with. Got it. Oh, attributes. Okay. So it's hard, keen, calm, and daring. So I remember when we read um, the Firelights one page CTRPG by Renee. Um, it wasn't like a like a brains brawn wit kind of situation, where your stats are like your physical characteristics or your mental characteristics. But it was like it was like how you approach situations. So do you approach it like boldly? Do you approach it like calmly, strategically? quietly like th those sorts of energies and that's a, that's an interesting way of handling stats where it's like it's not necessarily your physical or mental stats but rather what you're adept at how you're how you choose to handle situations and what you're best at so hard means hard-hearted aggressive mean cold and cruel you roll hard when you start fights take lives and make tough decisions Keen means keen senses, bright, aware, on the ball, head on a swivel. You roll keen to dodge fire, navigate, and talk your way out of trouble. Calm means calm and composed, careful, considerate by the book. You roll calm to safely land a plane, make repairs, convince others, and make human connections. I like how there's convince others as a concept and talk your way out of trouble as a separate concept. Daring means daring do, glory seeking, living on the edge. Uh, out of your mind. You're all daring when you put your plane or yourself through the impossible and when you want to brag about it. It's a stat you want to be a hero. This is notably... This one right here is notably more abstract than the rest of them. The rest of them are... These are like concrete ideas or things to do. And this is like when you choose to be a hero. I feel like hard, keen, and calm will get a lot of play. And then daring is something you do when the chips are down. But maybe that's just how I'm reading this. Stress and familiar vices. Oh, this, so this is this the concept of this is how you um, turn your stress points 
into experience points. So this is... The only thing you have to select here is your familiar vices, which are your ways of blowing off steam your pilot is accustomed to. But you can use this as a chance to get a handle on your stress triggers and vents. Every, each background has a variation of alcohol as a vice, as Himmelgard is a strong culture for social drinking. The others tend to be a bit more tied to the nature of the background, though there is overlap. Personal moves. Cool, and these are things that come with the character's background. Masteries. Mastery is the way you fly your plane in combat, your flavored tactics and strategies. Cool. And then the company over here is how you is how your people come together. So these are the prompt questions on um which honestly, prompt questions on how your group comes together. I believe that this should be standard to every game that has more than that has three or more players. I feel like a good tabletop RPG provides example questions on how parties come together because that's not always intuitive, especially with new players, especially with <laughs> the number of times I've started w in a tavern with, in with total strangers. Um, I, I highlighted this with the masks PPTA that they had a wonderful system of linking every character and then linking the character, the group as a whole. And I feel like this is a fantastic cornerstone to getting everybody on the same page when you start so you're giving so here you guys are um assigning what brought you guys together the goal of your company and the, your specialties so what kind of job do you check you choose to take things like that roundels or symbols oh that's cool i didn't know there was a word for that is roundel like a real historical word Cool. Company roster is NPCs. Got it. Or like just your your characters plus the NPCs on your team. You need to pay upkeep to all of these representing salaries, replacement parts, labor, lodging repairs. Golly, if there's a complicated money system in this game, uh, I mean, some people find this stuff fun, like managing your expenses and stuff. If you really want to get into the weeds of how you pay people, by all means, more power to you. Couldn't be me. <laughs> Could not be me. Employees. So these are NPCs that help you out. Okay. Do other maps here? No. Oh, so this is just like establishing the world. So it's a it's a basically a team effort in building out what the world looks like and the major focus of your campaign. Jason says, for military aircraft, a roundel is a circular badge or insignia that is usually applied to the fuselage, wings, and or tail surfaces. These national markings are used to identify the aircraft. Wonderful. Great. Okay, so they call the um, the game structure the routine. A routine is a fixed loop at the core of the game when you take off at the start of the flight until just before you go on the next one. The routine is what gives flying circus structure and it meters out the financial system of the game to make sure your pilots can always afford to fly their cutting edge airplanes and go on fantastical adventures. Broadly, the two parts of the routine are the mission and business and pleasure. Generally speaking, the routine begins and ends at the pre-flight check portion. Pre-flight check portion. That's an interesting detail. That before you decide to fly off somewhere and, and, and accomplish a daring mission, there's a process, like a checklist that you guys go through before actually going off. That's actually interesting. That's a, that's an important, that's attention to detail. These two sections are independent, are de 
These two sections are dependent on each other, creating a constant cycle. You take missions and fly to get money. You spend money to deal with injuries, improve your planes, and mitigate stress. Repeat. Your first game can start anywhere on the routine, though jumping straight into the action is best. You can play a dozen minor routines in a session, or spend three sessions exploring every aspect of one phase. Both phases have natural termination points. You'll run out of fuel in the air, or out of money or consciousness on the ground. Oh, what a handy wheel. So they recommend you start with this, the action, then you got to land. There's a whole section on landing. Interesting. There's a whole section on landing. And stress relief. This is where you convert stress to experience points. Manage finances, find a new job, reflect on everything that's happened so far, and then back to pre-flight and action. Oh. Huh. This kind of wheel is so curious to me. Mostly because when you try to put it into con and if you try to put it into the context of like if a wheel existed in Dungeons and Dragons, what would it look like, right? And the wheel would basically be um get a job like where fi find the job prepare for the job fight escape landing would be escape right and then um act after escape then yeah 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 then out of combat downtime dispersing loot finding new job right and then reflection is just kind of something that happens all throughout this. Any, any landing you can walk away from is a good landing. Um, Shepard says, usually landing is pretty simple and quick unless it becomes complicated like not having landing gear. Oh, an engine. Okay. Downtime ends when you fall asleep. Yeah, I mean... I'm just so I'm just so interested that like there's like a well, but well, it makes like it makes sense in a, in a system where half of the game is flying and half the game is not flying. It makes sense that this is a very I wouldn't say rigid, but I'm guessing these these blurry lines here indicate that these four things can happen in any order. You know, this is just a suggestion of the order that it happens in. I like it. Yeah, and we kind of figured out what all of these mean. Okay, universal moves. So these are moves that you can use freely during any part of the routine. So this is during flight and not during flight, whenever you feel like it. Press your luck. Press your luck. When you take a risk, you do it. And the consequences unfold. Complications will arise naturally from GM moves. So if it isn't covered by a specific move, leave the dice alone. Pilots do not roll skill checks. I don't know what this means. Pilots do not roll skill checks. Oh, is this just like a like in real life? Pirates don't roll skill checks. Yeah, like if you can do it. If you can do it and it's like. Not this is the this is the idea that not everything needs a roll, right? Not everything has to be rolled for. If you're properly adept at something, not everything has to be rolled for. Um, so if you want to, to put it into like a fantasy standpoint, if you want to jump off of a cliff uh, and dra and fall onto a monster with your sword, you don't have to roll for that. You just kind of do it <laughs> and then it happens. Uh, and then you deal with the consequences when you land, right? And then and then we hash everything out. But like, there's nothing to to stop you from jumping off a cliff and doing it. This is a good, kind of the same energy. Break trust. When you lose trust in the comrade, erase their mark and choose one. Keep your feeling hidden and take one stress. Um, show directly and explicitly how you feel and remove one stress. Oh, I know what this means now. So, if you don't talk about your problems with somebody, take one stress. But when you do. Remove one stress. That makes a lot of sense. 
show don't tell slap them in the face scream at them and throw things at them slam the door in their face make love to their sweet sweetheart in broad daylight atop their favorite plane make drama <laughs> Okay, cool, 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 cool. Oh, this one here. Restore trust. When you show faith in a comrade, mark trust and take one stress. Oh, I take one stress. I saying I trust you means a lot less than giving something up, protecting them, sharing a familiar gesture, leaving your life in their hands, or kissing them passionately atop a burning zeppelin. As usual, this is between characters, not players, unless you two do actually want to make out. Help hinder. When you put yourself at risk to help a comrade, give them advantage forward. If you didn't trust them, restore trust. When you make a point to hinder a comrade, give them disadvantage forward. If you trusted them, break trust. Help hinder is the primary way that advantage and disadvantage enters play and is an extremely important move. However, this assistance must go beyond just being present with an event or doing the same thing at the same time. There must be danger. And you must put yourself at risk to protect screw over your friend the risk is important help or hindrance that doesn't put you at risk doesn't count because there's nothing special about it valid this, oh this is what i wanted to look into discover beauty That's some good artwork once per routine when you witness beauty in the world described how you are moved by what you see and lose one stress Flying Circus has its root in Studio Ghibli films, and a running theme through many of these films is that the natural world and the lives we live are beautiful, dangerous, and frightening. The moments like this, where they feel small before something vast, when they look on a place or a person with unreserved awe, are the moments, the experiences, that make it all worth it. This move is for when the GM describes a breathtaking landscape, when you come over a hill and see a lovely little town, when you return to your childhood home after a long absence, or when you first catch sight of your lover on the wedding day. It's up to the player when this move kicks in, but it shouldn't be done casually. This move defines what your character sees as beautiful. I like that line. Uh, and this beauty must be unexpected, unique, or special. A single fleeting or exceptional moment. Nothing about it can be routine or usual, and you shouldn't use the same thing twice for this move. Valid. Intimacy. When, one, when you share an emotional and possibly physical intimacy with one or more characters, all PCs activate their intimacy move. To be clear, intimacy does not mean sex, but also does not mean sex. It represents a moment of closeness and vulnerability between two or more characters for its own sake. If you're trying to manipulate somebody, press the issue plus keen. If there's no strings attached, it's a vice. Eh, interesting. This <laughs> Amazing that there's a mechanic attached to that. This distinction creates several nuanced meanings to sex and attraction in the game. A character might engage in casual sex as a vice and not be afraid to use sex to get ahead, but one day she kisses her best friend and it's more real and scary and meaningful than she was ready for. The character's sexuality or incomprehensible orientations doesn't need to matter, likewise it doesn't need to imply romantic love. An aromantic character can still share an intimate moment. Furthermore, nothing about this move implies there should only should two parties involved. Intimacy with an important NPC character can create this move. But sometimes its effects won't apply because the NPCs usually don't roll dice. This is an important PBTA concept that like the GM doesn't necessarily have to roll or doesn't necessarily roll ever. They just do say things and they happen. In these cases, any, any time an NPC would get a dice bonus from the inactivation, they automatically accomplish whatever attack is affected or they're saved from harm's way as appropriate. You probably shouldn't play out intimate scenes at the table. Uh, generally speaking, this should at least be the implication that the act of intimacy has happened within the narrative. No presumably. No hand waves. Earn it in the story. Valid. Good to know. Interesting thing to address as part of the main universal moves. Not against it, not for it. But I like that they kind of delineate between being personal and intimate and emotional with somebody versus trying to manipulate them versus having no basically being apathetic about it so like you can use intimacy in your games but understand there's different levels to how people are interpreted that's actually pretty unique at least from things i've read i dig that anyway 
instrument panel. Your instrument panel helps you keep all the various elements and stats of your aircraft as they change from damage, bombs drop, and fuel consumed. Your component cards, I don't know what this is, are a part of it as well, though you can just use a notepad instead of printing them out. Make sure your instrument panel matches all... Th so this is what you were talking about. Um, was it splotchy or was it somebody else? That is... What's up, Sailing Master? No, pro no problem coming late. There's always a VOD. You can just watch there. Um, someone mentioned that there's... Like, resource tracking is a big concept in, like... As, as, un as I've understood it, like, European board games. But, you know. Um, I'm assuming these are useful in tracking your stats. Um, as the game goes on. Airspeed not to do set to zero. Write down your max toughness and max strain. Make sure the photo on your <laughs> instrument panel has a cute drawing of your sweethearts. Whoa! What is going on here? <laughs> okay. As somebody... Splotchy says, yeah, it's very much an abstract Euro game boiled on... Bolted onto a PBTA RPG. <laughs> Okay, just for the record, as someone who is reading this for the first time, this diagram right here is intimidating. <laughs> There's a lot going on. Okay, okay, so altitude. This is simple enough. It's how high you go. Airspeed. This is simple enough. This is how high you go. G-force. This is how stressful it is on your body when you're traveling. This is a picture of your loved one right here. Um, stress level is a flat number. Vital parts is a part of your plane. Fuel is a number. I don't know what this is. This is a tilt? Is this tilt? Is that a mechanic? It's... Boost, handling, climb, stall, speed, full load, half fuel, bombs, full fuel, no bombs, half fuel, no bombs, empty. Stability, energy loss, visibility, t crash. What is this? What is this? <laughs> okay, well, we're going to read these one at a time because this feels like something very unique to this game. Altimeter. Oh, that's interesting. Hey, Josh, we have two people in chat who have flown a plane before. That's unique and not something I expected in a, in a game, in a tabletop RPG live stream. Um, your altimeter gouge is a two-part circular gouge gauge. Your altimeter, altimeter gauge is a two-part circular gauge which separately tracks the ones and tens place of your altitude. This gauge will change frequently over the course of play. Place two tokens onto your altimeter. The usual convention is for outer ring to represent the ones place and inner ring to represent the tens. Oh! Oh, okay. Ah, oh, wait, 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 wait. Ones place. Tens place. Oh, 12. Okay, okay. 12 altitude means 1200 meters. So the 1000 plus 200. Got it, got it. I'm keeping up. I'm keeping up here. <laughs> okay, okay. This is altimeter's height, right? Altitude. Great. Airspeed. It's the same thing. The same thing, but for airspeed. I know airspeed. Kilometers per hour. European game. Understood. <laughs> Below and to the right of your airspeed is your drop-off stat. I don't know what this word means. Below and to the right of your, the airspeed indicator is your drop-off stat. This stat affects your acceleration, so it's useful here. Drop-off relates to acceleration. Things I will know soon enough. Wet stats. Whew. Okay, guys, okay. A plane stats change as they lose mass. What a bit, what a wild concept to put into a tabletop game. <laughs> that, that takes effect when the fuel is drained to half or fully when all the bombs are gone or when the tank is completely empty. There is 
dynamic weight changes oh my gosh dynamic okay okay this is a special kind of fun this is a special kind of fun boost is acceleration handling is nimbleness climb is the rate of steady climb and stall speed is when you stall out What does stall out mean? This is a word I don't know. Uh, pilots in chat, because I know there's at least two of you. Pilots in chat, what does this mean? What does stall speed mean? Speed is your max speed in level flight. Okay. 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 Acceleration. Boost is acceleration. We're going to learn about boost soon enough. Handling. Why does it go up to 100, 101? Stalling out means you fall out of the sky. Got it. Good to know. <laughs> Good to know. Climb speed is the rate of steady, steady climb. Stall speed is when you die. And speed is your max speed. Okay, so it makes sense that no bombs, half fuel is the fastest. Full load is... A technically the slowest half fuel and bombs so we're saying that bombs are about equal to a half a fuel tank full fuel no bombs oh my gosh i wonder what the i wonder what how critical the difference between 98 and 100 is in terms of a game very curious how crucial this number is and how much it differs from this Thank you for everybody in chat who knows what stall out means. <laughs> this is a highly, this is a highly equipped, highly high credential, um, <laughs> YouTube chat. I love that. Uh, when, while you're carrying bombs, rockets, cargo, cash, and you have plus one turn bleed. See dry stats. Golly, there's a, there's a dry stat section. When you're out of fuel, boost and climb don't apply anymore. Max and people always go down to zero. Yeah, that makes sense because you're dead and you've stalled out. Oh, when you're when you have no fuel, of course. Well, of course. Yeah. Okay, those are these are all concepts that I generally understand. How is this gonna change on the next page? Dry stats. These stats don't change during a sortie. I know this word because of fire emblem. Visibly is how easily it's it is to see out of a plane, sure. Energy loss is speed loss to air resistance, while turn bleed is speed loss in turns. Stability is rolled when your plane goes out of control, and flight stress is how taxing the aircraft is to fly. If there's a second flight stress in brackets, that number is the flight stress of passengers in that seat who never touch the controls. This is a lot to put into two paragraphs. Stability is rolled when your plane goes out of control. Flight stress is how taxing the aircraft is to fly. This is an interesting concept. I didn't know that there are aircraft that are like notably more difficult to fly than others. I figured that would factor into like basically speed and control. Structure. Max strain and toughness combined to act as the hit points of your plane. Hit points. These are hit points. Your max strain is how many G's your plane can withstand. G's is uh, is a term of force. I only know the phrase G force, which is when you're on a roller coaster and you're pushed to a very fast speed. I love, I love having things understood in very simple civilian context <laughs> with the word number being the tens place your toughness to buffer bonus points hits points above that use the quarter circle to listen as rain total to make the list check oh this is this is remaining in total okay sure 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 you're tougher oh so this is like this is hp this this is this is temp HP. No, this is current HP. This is max HP. And this is temp HP. 
Okay. Two G's being you feel twice as heavy. Oh. So five G's is five times heavier. I'm learning so much today. <laughs> Damage subtracts first from toughness because that's temp HP. Uh, we're using D and D brain for this. Then from max strain. Once max strain reaches zero, the plane disintegrates. Perfect. Great to know. Thank you for the heads up. And this is what happens when you reach max strain. <laughs> Safety stats. Safety stats are only ever rolled when you jump out of a plane and crash land. Oh, jumping out of plane can mechanics. Copy them over and hope you never need to roll them. <laughs> Aircraft notes. Vital parts. Copy from the plane sheet. When parts get hit, mark them so you know they don't work anymore. Oh, so it's either they work or they don't. Great. Armor is used to protect vital spots. I'm assuming armor is something you build up over the course of the journey or things that are built into the plane, like some planes have certain armors, and then you can like enhance them as you advance. Ordnance tracks your bombs and rockets. Mark down the number of bombs and their mass. Once they're all gone, you use the no bomb stats. Wow, I don't know what this means yet. 15 times 1 mass HE times 8 3 mass fire. These are words. These are words that I don't know and probably won't know. I'm so excited that there are people in chat who like know what this is talking about. I think this this is this is so highly this is like me um this is like me talking about that one academia game and having a room full of prof having a chat full of professors telling me about the the nuances of academia. This is such an interesting YouTube chat to have. <laughs> like every every post that happens is so beyond me. And I'm glad you guys are communicating with each other because I'm <laughs> I feel this feels like when um when uh, a five-year-old is sitting at the adults table and they're asking about dinosaurs no the solar system they're asking about the solar system and all the adults are chiming in <laughs> about about the specific things they know about outer space and they all know vaguely similar things but also niche things that they individually know this is how i feel i'm the five-year-old there's like a bib around my neck there's a plate of, of string beans and broccoli that i haven't eaten yet and in this metaphor, the string beans and and um, broccoli are the other 250 pages of Flying Circus. <laughs> G-Force Tracker. I know what this means now because Chad explained it to me. Um, the long skinny track from 0 to 10 tells you how... 10? Tells you how much strain to play in and pilot are currently experiencing. Just place the marker down on 0 and move it as the move required. Simple as that. It's not one to one with real. G okay, it's not one to one with real G forces. Seeing that that's really complex, it's just an abstraction. Wonderful. G force tracker is a penalty to all your personal rolls while in effect. So always remember to check where it is before you roll your dice. Kill tally, number of kills. Easy enough. Picture, picture, and we got through it. We did it. We did it. That's the whole thing. We know this whole thing. Weapon stats. <laughs> it's like I stepped out of, of, of second level biology and walked into an advanced chemistry class. There is a lot to process here. And I'm sure broken down step by step, a lot of these make a lot of sense. And honestly, this is probably very similar to a D&D &D longbow. If I were to really take a D&D &D longbow and put all the numbers and abilities into certain boxes. But boy, this is... <laughs> I, I, was, I was very confidently... I was very confidently like, oh, I know Powered by the Apocalypse. I understand this game. 2D10s instead of 2D6s, I can keep up. Universal moves, I can keep up. But then they hit me with this. And then this. 
and tell me that these are things that <laughs> come up in a regular air combat. There's an audience for this. I might not be that audience, but there's an audience for this. For people who have played... Uh, Josh, you can clip it in the future. Um, if it helps Wintry, it really is easier when it's in motion. Oh, I believe that. I 100% believe that. This this game feels like a game where um, you you get your friends to play. They don't really know too much about the game. And they learn things along the way. And all of those things make sense um, as you learn them. But as someone like me who's reading this like a textbook rather than a guidebook to play a game. Um, this is a lot. And this is just me being small brain, but <laughs> this is just me appreciating very, very simple games like Potato. If anybody remembers that, I understood Potato. There was like one rule. Um, this, the games like this, I imagine, are very... Are, this feeling that I'm feeling right now is probably the same feeling that people who aren't really into medieval fantasy, the feeling they get when they look at the weapons page... Uh, in D and D, where it's like I don't really care what these words are, but um, you know what? It's close to 10 p.m. on my on my side of the world. Um, I do. I won't attempt to understand the weapon mechanics. I won't. I will just acknowledge that it exists. And I acknowledge that I could probably learn this if I played this game at least once. A lot of these would make sense to me almost immediately. I'm sure. I'm positive. And I'm glad that a game like this exists. And someone is willing to go into all the details of not only the mechanics of a plane and flying a plane, but also the weapons attached to it. Uh, Shark Francis just came in from the sound of your side. It sounds like that the like it sounds like that overcomplicated Africa campaign game. I have no idea what game that is, but if you're talking about a board game, I know there there are plenty of board game like what is it? Stellaris I've heard is famously like very, very long. Now, I don't think that's the same energy. Let's do move stuff. <laughs> I'll I'll I want let's let's do get going. No, no, no. Well, I want to look at... Actually, contact, great. Air control, great. I want to actually look at air combat, and then we'll wrap up there. Did, I, I want to say that I, I did... <laughs> I will admit to sighing or taking a deep breath when I saw the weapons page. This is not a demerit against the game. I think I think we have to... We have to establish. Now, we have to establish here. Okay, I'm going to talk to you guys because you, a lot of you guys here are... Um, are ve are the usual watchers, right? Are the usual watchers of these streams, and I appreciate you guys. And you guys are going to Solaris is a video game. That's not the game I'm talking about. That it's a different game. Um, but <laughs> um, I don't personally uh, have the opportunity to play every game I cover. I don't. I may or may not leave. Uh, read through of a game not wanting to play it and that's valid right the great majority of the games i'm going to cover in this 99 more series are recommendations and i'm kind of going on on the basis of trust to make sure that the game is at the very least appropriate for stream but i reserve the right to not necessarily um let's rephrase that to find games I like more than others. And that's just how it goes. So to say that this game is bad is not the message I'm leaving. To say that this game is probably not my cup of tea is more accurate. But the level of detail in this game is so, so interesting to me. And I wonder what other very niche 
um, interests or hobbies or enthusiasts or, or topics have games to this level of detail, right? Like, could you imagine if there's, there was a game here, the, the, a game like this existed, but it was about piloting or riding dinosaurs. And then they would go into the combat stats of every dinosaur and the merits of the era they lived in and the dynamics of their interactions or natural predators or food change or things like that. Like that specific level of detail, that niche amount of knowledge or expertise is so interesting to me. And it's these kinds of games, like, like this one specifically, these kinds of games that I love diving into on stream, that I love having as part of this series. Because I'm looking to look find games that are so beyond my little Venn diagram circle of the games that I know. Uh, and I hope to cover them. So, um, would I, Do I like reading this game? Yes. Would I like to play this game? Maybe less than others. Um, would I recommend it to other people? If this is your interest, if you're, this is the level of detail you want to play, absolutely. Sure thing. Um, just let it, just let it be known as you watch these streams, um, that, uh, I'm not necessarily the biggest advocate for every game I cover, but every game I cover, I believe is worth the time and energy to at least read and understand it. So let's look to eyeball because I see a lot of people look, talk, telling me about eyeball. I need to know what that means. Eyeball, eyeball. Eyeball is mentioned a whole lot of times. Eyeball, eyeball. Did I miss it? I did miss it. Let me go back to the let me go back to the front. Eyeball. 76. Let's just skip this page 76. Because people have been talking about this move very particularly and and I got to know what it means before I end this stream. Okay. I'm going to read this from the top. Support moves. These moves are for gunners, observers, and the other support crew, though pilots will be called to make some of these actions themselves. Eyeball. When you scan around you, ask one of these questions or devise a new one. Roll plus keen plus invisible plus visibility we know this this is a dry stat we knew that because we read before if you aren't currently flying the plane add plus three makes sense if you're not flying a plane it's a lot easier to look at stuff if you have other crew looking at as well take advantage where have they gone what is that who is that what is hidden there where is their weak point regardless of your role the gm gives an answer and when you take advantage and you take advantage forward to react on a 16 plus the answer puts you in a position of strength on a miss the answer is one you don't want to hear oh well this is just a fate changer interesting eyeball <laughs> ties into the no object permanence rule mentioned in page 58 we'll go back to see what this is frequently over the course of a flight of a fight, players will lose sight of things, not even through hard moves, just as a result of the general chaos of the combat. To find them again, they use eyeball. This is also a way for the gym to introduce new information and create escalations. If they ask who the target is and roll badly, well, now their target is a feared enemy ace, right? You didn't have anything hidden in the clouds before, but now there's a dragon. That's a cool concept. Let me read page 58 and then I will. <laughs> Awareness. Pilots are like babies. They don't have object permanence. Wait, where is that? Is there a context here? The best way to handle pilot awareness is to simply assume that anything not immediately being dealt with has disappeared off into the cloud somewhere and can come back at any time. Don't bother trying to track everything in the flight in the fight. It is too difficult and won't add anything. Wonderful. It's 
So that's interesting. So for people who have played this game, when you're doing combat, is combat theater of the mind? And all the important things are tracked via your tracking sheets, command sheets, something like that. Um, so you like keep track of your own personal stats. Everybody keeps track of their own personal stats and their own playing situation. And then there's like an abstract of what the, f the sky looks like. Like there's no, it would make no sense to make battle maps of flight, right? interesting yeah 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 that makes a lot of sense to me because trying to <laughs> trying to establish vertical and horizontal um positioning in in this game in particular sounds like a nightmare so theater of the mind makes a lot of sense to me and add it and the way you make that concrete and the way you keep that like tangible to people is to just have these stat sheets where you keep track of your own personal stats yeah that makes total sense to me cool Nice. Is there anything else we wanted to check out before I call it a night? Let me see what I highlighted. Hmm. Yeah, that's it'd be so hard to have minis for this too. Where are you gonna where do you guys have plain minis? I'm sure some of you do. Actually, that's a dumb question. I'm sure some of you do. Um, yeah, I want let's look at which. I'm curious how they handle magic. Y'all know I'm a sucker for magic. The witches. The old world of empires and machines was rarely kind to women. It controlled their lives, denied their dreams, and took children to feed the war machine. Those who did not or could not fit these societies, narrow definitions of womanhood fared especially badly. Unsurprisingly, they were those who escaped it, and on the outskirts of the so-called civilized world, they rediscovered a birthright long denied to them. The witches hail from reclus reclusive, reclusive covens, where the like-minded have gathered to explore mythical power. They are one of the most mechanically unique classes and having access to a special free form system to cast magical spells. Casting magical spells in an, in an airplane game? Wait a sec. The witch can opt to ignore many of the technical elements and just get on by magic. They can forego their plan for an enchanted broomstick or stay in the observer seat and focus on casting spells. The free form magic system the witches use is well suited to creative and imaginative players, having few restrictions beyond what you can dream up. The witch is also adept at navigating the wild, being able to parlay a more even playing field and make demands of the fae. The witches have their roots in recurring ideas of physical femininity, femininity, especially modern Dianic Wicca, which attempts to reclaim mythology that portrays women as powerful and sacred in contrast to the historical Christian narrative of women as unclean, subservient, and secondary. Witches also draw dark inspiration from feminist and lesbian separatism, political movements from the 60s and 70s which believe that patriarchy cannot be overcome and women must create their own societies away from free from men accompanying political lesbianism interesting bonded oh so they do have things casting magic oh there is a whole magic system well look at that well i'm not going to learn this either but Huh. Now, I wonder. Now, hear me out. I wonder. Are there games of this game where there are certain playbooks that aren't allowed? Because this seems like... This seems like a buy-in sort of thing, right? This seems like a... I, some people want their plain game, but don't want magic in their plain game. You know how people don't like guns in the D&D? Like, this feels like something that you have to get the okay from from your game master to be like i want to play a witch in this flying plane game it's interesting that this is in the core playbook as one of like uh, the core book this is like something that is innately tied to the setting but i imagine that there's some people who just don't like this sort of thing
Bocce Inc. says, Do you understand the breadth of World War One biplane minis you can easily get? I can imagine it. I can say, I, I've seen people who like trains. I've seen people who like Gundams. It would not surprise me at all if there are a great many um, build your own planes out there. Okay, well. Okay, well, if you guys are interested in this, I hope that, wow. Sorry, I was immediately caught by there also being handheld weapons. I'm sorry, there are weapons you can have when you are on the ground. My bad. <laughs> My bad? Okay. <laughs> Look at all these. Hand grenade. Dynamite charge. Anti-armor rifle. Personal armor. Skyborne wingsuit. All right, all right, all right. They, they're they like, okay, Wintry, I saw that you weren't a big fan of the plane part. Well, how about the ground part where people just have weapons? This is so thorough. This is so thorough. The bombing section, this is so thorough. This is out of control. This is, there, there is so much happening here. Ornithoppers, they have ornithoppers. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, this, guys, this is... Oh, that's a sick picture. This is sick, too. Oh, my gosh. Wow. All right, guys. Um, This is where... <laughs> this is where I'm going to call it. Um, This is Flying Circus. Uh, my, in my assessment of this after reading it for an hour and a half. A thoroughly comprehensive game on air combat and everything involved in air combat very specifically based in aviation fantasy in a magical world that also deals with a surplus of flying vehicles um handling not only mythology um but also the detailed mechanics of plane structure uh all the things and all the mechanics involved in flight and uh, how blindingly confusing that is to a layman not used to <laughs> flight um the details of weapons on and off the plane if you're looking for you maybe you don't even have to play this game you maybe you don't even have to play it you could just use this game as a resource to fuel playing air combat in other games there's just if you want to play this game by all means play this game but by no means is it limited it, it's not just a mechanics game it's also a resource and setting in in weapons and inventory and in uh, in PBTA styles. This is this has its own flavor on how it handles the PBTA system. I, I as somebody who might not ever play this game, will probably treat this more as something that you could that I could research to learn more about how games are constructed from the ground up and how detailed and in intricate you can get with them um but yeah flying circus check it out <laughs> um that's all the time i have for tonight uh thank you guys as always for dropping by a lot of you guys are familiar faces so thank you guys as always for being here um see you guys next week i don't know what i'm reading next week but i'm sure it'll be something interesting if you have any recommendations leave them in the comments of this video and or my twitter which is twitter.com slash wintry rpg uh or you can email me at the wintry wyvern at gmail.com as always I, refer to, I reserve the rights to not review that game just simply send me suggestions and i'll add it to my ever-growing list of many 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 games but it is so good to see you all here have a wonderful night